Connor Garden Bishop, welcome to the Beyond the Surface podcast. How are we doing, bro? Good, bro. Thanks for having me on. No, nah, mate, always a pleasure. And for those who can't see us, we're currently mm. sipping a Spate Summit ultra low carb beer. I thought we'll go after ultra lows because you're an athlete. You know how it is. Oh, yeah. Shredding for summer, baby. Awesome. <laughs> hey, bro, thanks so much for jumping on the potty. Um, before we get started, um, you know, if you could just introduce yourself for those people who don't know you, who is Conan Garda Bishop? Um, what do you do? Hey, uh, I'm Connor Garden Bishop, uh, born in London, raised in Wellington, uh, professional rugby player, I guess, for the past few years, um, chasing my dream and doing that, and uh, part of a big family and father of two young girls. So. Love it, brother. That's mm. awesome. Um, how did you get into, you know, the pathway of playing professional rugby for, I think, probably every single young New Zealander, you know, that is, that is the dream in many regards. What was your pathway to become a professional rugby player? Good question, but I guess my pathway was sort of paved for me before I was even born. As you know, I come from a bit of a rich rugby background, uh, having a dad that played for New Zealand and Samoa as well. Um, my mum actually played for the Black Ferns as well, and a couple of uncles and two cousins are all, all blacks, as well as my older brother. So I think it's fair to say rugby is in my DNA, and... Um, yeah, it's something that I grew up loving and, and always aspiring to be. It was sort of, um, like like many other Kiwis, it was, it was my dream from day one. Mm. So I was that kid that, um, you know, slept with a rugby ball. I showered with it. It was my baby. So um, I guess, yeah, it's sort of what I always wanted to be, you know. It was what I was always good at. And, um, yeah, and I had some great role models that helped me get to where I am. So I'm pretty grateful for that upbringing. And like, yeah, it is. What's in the, you know, Garden Bishop sort of bloodline to produce so many, you know, world-class athletes? I'm sure there'll be some conversations with Rugby NZ and also the Barretts um, around what they can do to maybe, you know, make the super athlete there. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I wouldn't call us super athletes. I don't know. Uh Far out, who knows? Maybe we just got um, a lot of ticker, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, and so you, you you went to Scots College, played first 15 rugby there, and then from Scots you moved down to Christchurch um, and signed with them for Mitre 10. Um, do you want to just speak through sort of that process of getting your first professional contract and what that meant to you? Yeah, bro. Um, so I went to Scots. Obviously, that sort of started my rugby career when I made the, I made the New Zealand Barbarians in year 13, which – helped me gain a little bit of interest around myself um so yeah Canterbury approached me as well as Wellington and I sort of had to weigh up um the two unions and, and which pathway I wanted to take uh it was a hard decision because you know all my mates were here family was in Wellington but I knew um Canterbury sort of had this reputation for breeding mm -hmm. literally breeding um professional rugby players so I think my heart was telling me to stay, but my head was telling me to go. So when I when I did make the decision and and just followed through with it and and got on the plane down south, it was one that I didn't regret because as soon as I got there, I could tell like I made the right decision. Yeah. Um, I was in a academy, a Crusaders academy, with like a bunch of great lads. Like we all got on real well, and the standards that they drive down down there sort of um, set me up for for going forward and and life as well as as rugby. But yeah, I guess getting that opportunity to go down south was, um, it was massive, bro. It was awesome. It's something that I'm pretty grateful for and I'm grateful for my time in Christchurch. But um, yeah, bro, it was good. Man. Um, and then you got the opportunity, you, you signed for the Highlanders, oh, sorry, you signed for uh, the Wellington Lions before that. So after your time in Christchurch, um, how did that come about? Yeah, bro. So I played. I was in Christchurch for a couple of years. Went to Lincoln Uni, which was a good time. Shout out to the Rams. Um, and I, so I had two years there, and I absolutely loved it. So I knew at the at the end of those two years, when my initial contract was up, and I had to make another decision whether I stayed um, in Canterbury and re-signed or uh, signed with Wellington, who had approached me again, sort of um, offering similar contracts. So it was it was like I had to make the same decision. Uh, all over again but the roles were reversed yeah. because like you know I've I've spent two years absolutely grinding in Christchurch um 
to sort of make these teams and get a bit of a name for myself down there, I guess. Um, but then, so my heart was almost in Christchurch again, but my head um, saw this real good opportunity in Wellington. You know, they offered me um, a good opportunity to play fullback, play with my brother. How special is that? Like, oh, you know, to play and lace up with your bro. Um, what was that? What was that feeling like? You know, actually running onto the field with him for the first time. Oh, bro! Before before we ran on, just even getting to go to work with your older brother, like every day we roll up and um, we're, we're all shaking hands. But then, like w- one of these guys that I'm shaking hands with is my brother. You know, like he's the guy. He's five years older than me, so he's always been a little bit ahead. But I guess. Just to be in the same team as as someone like that, they always, I guess, idolised growing up as f- fucking mean. One hundred percent, so mean, bro. Um, the first time we played together was actually for Norths. Um, that's that's both our home club growing up. I think we might have even played against um, Periplum. Oh, you guys just lost down- that game, eh? <laughs> yeah, lost. I think no, I think the score was like one hundred and one five. Was yeah, it? Yeah, well, I'll mute that one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, skip forward that one, bro. Yeah. But um, yeah, our first game together for the Lions was against Tasman, and we got pumped. But I remember I ran out, um, I ran out in front of him, and just having him him behind me was like, bro, it's the best feeling. It's something I don't know. It's just it's just what you dream of. Like we always dreamed of being in the All Blacks together. So I guess that was sort of the start of our journey playing together, and it's yeah, it's something I'll. F- cherish forever that's beautiful bro mm. um is and you know with every sibling is there a lot of sort of competitiveness as well even if you're in the same team um nah me and jackson oh, we don't really compete against each other we, we've got a good uh relationship we, we we just want the best for each other and i guess we're we're different as like we play different positions and we don't really from a team perspective we're not in a position where we need to compete but i guess like off the field, like um, training wise and stuff, we'll, we'll we'll like have a subtle like, come on, boy, let's go, like you know, as brothers do. And I think it's probably it's probably um got a bit, I don't know, closer over the few ye- over the last few years as I've gone a bit bigger because he was way bigger than me um for a lot of our I guess childhood, but um yeah, it's not so much a competitive relationship, right? We just try push each other you know yeah yeah in a healthy way mm. um so then you're with the lions and then you get the opportunity to be signed mm. by the by the highlanders in 2020 um talk to us about that year and what and, and what it meant to you to sign you know a contract in the super rugby um that's if, if there's any footballers out there who loves soccer you know um the super rugby is like the premier league yeah. for new zealand and international rugby really mm. um it's the upper echelon. It's where all of the All Blacks play, uh, all the top athletes in the world um, who lace up for rugby play in the Super Rugby. What did that What did that mean mean for you, bro? To you know finally sign that um, that contract with the Highlanders? I actually couldn't believe it. Eh? Um, it was yeah. So it was my it was my first year back in Wellington after being in Christchurch for two years, and I was. I was having a bit of a rough year, like I was battling away with injuries, um, with my with a sore back, and I just missed out on like NZ twenties because of it, because of these injuries. And I was missing my mates, and I was sitting there, and I was like, man, I was almost doubting whether I should have moved back. Like, would this have happened if I stayed in Canterbury, sort of thing? And I was missing my mates that I made down there. And then um, it wasn't long after I found out I wasn't going to be a part of the New Zealand under twenties that the Highlanders approached my agent and said, oh, we want to get Connor down to train. And I said, oh, sorry, guys, like I can't, I'm injured. And they tried two or three times. And then on, on the third or fourth time um, they tried, they said, oh, we don't actually want you to train with us. We want to offer you a contract for the next few years. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, I was like freaking out because I talked to my agent and he and he sent me the contract and I was only 19 at the time. Like, wow. yeah, this is, I was still pretty young. And for a kid, like looking at, this was this was me like looking at my future and I sort of thought like first of all I was like man like they're taking a bit of a gamble here because I haven't I hadn't really proven myself at that stage so I was just like really grateful and bro it was like a dream come true I knew I knew that this was like going to be the start of my actual uh, professional rugby journey and I've 
fucking was so stoked eh? I was like this is mean dude yeah I can I can even see it you know when you're when you're speaking about it now like you're still lighting up yeah bro. um and that year 2020 so you were still battling injuries throughout mm. that year right did you get any chance to play on the footy field or did that happen in 2021 um 2020 I I was battling a bad back and I got I got through the season I had a few um cortisone injections in my back my lower back which didn't really help at all it was just like putting a plaster and trying to save a licking boat it was terrible yeah. like I was that sore are they nasty to get by the way ah uh, bro they're pretty sore to be honest like when they put the needle in and they put some sort of anesthetic in there but you can still feel it and they start injecting like Ugh. this um steroid into you <laughs> and I could just feel it tingling down like it sent like an electric shock down my sciatic nerve which goes all the way down your yep. leg and it was, <laughs> it was so sore bro but i had a couple of those no anti-vaxxers for cortisone injections i'm guessing <laughs> <laughs> nah man i was asking for more was that sore but um what was the question bro i sort of went uh, off about injuries in 2020 oh yeah and then um so i didn't actually have any surgeries or anything that year i was just battling with a bulge disc um and I was lucky enough to play a couple games, but I I just hang on like I was I was battling sort of thing. And then by the time I got down to the Highlanders, they took one look at me and they were like, "Bro, you're fucked." They saw me run once and they were like, they they pulled me back inside. And this was like, I was going down there sort of um, hoping to start off my prof professional career, you know, like make good impressions, train real hard, and then hopefully play for the Highlanders. Um, and they took one look at me and they were like, bro, you, you need surgery like ASAP. And this was the first um, I'd even heard the word surgery like being thrown around. So to hear that, I guess it, it broke me a little bit. Like it was before but the season had even started. I went down early just to try to get a head start because I knew I was, you know, I was young and they try and do that. Um, and yeah, unfortunately I got ruled out from day minus one. You know, so I was out for the year after that, um, and, which was tough. And you're, you know, you're going into this team. You want to make that first impression, and mm -hmm. you're probably one of the most hungry players there in terms of being a rookie, mm -hmm. wanting to debut, impress the coaches, and really make a name for yourself. What, what did that really make you feel? You know, what sort of feelings did you have inside when you knew you had to have surgery and actually go through this sort of setback? <sighs> A lot goes through your head, bro. A lot goes through your head. But I guess in terms of like me going into that environment um, and not being able to prove myself on the field, that was probably the hardest thing. Like all these guys, you know, they're new to the team, but at least they get to earn respect and earn, and, and build these relationships on the field, you know, when you're uh, going through these tough days at the office. And I didn't have that. So I guess it was tough. I sort of felt like a little bit left out in my first year down there. But I, I say that, but I still had an awesome time because the Highlanders environment is really cool. Like it's it's driven by the players and, and I guess led by the coaches and there's an awesome group of boys down there. So it's cool. But yeah, it was it was definitely tough. I sort of felt like it was a little bit hard to connect with some of the boys and I was just, yeah, I was itching to get out there, bro. Yeah, that must have been mm. so frustrating. Yeah. What is it like to go into that environment? You know, you're in a team with Aaron Smith, you know, all black greats. So what's it like to be rubbing shoulders with him in the changing room and just, you know, behind the scenes? Bro, like when you talk about it like that, you're like, holy shit, it sounds crazy. It is but crazy. Like, it is crazy. It is crazy. But then when you meet these guys, you realize oh, they're actually just one of the boys. Like I remember the first first couple of days I met um, Nuggy, Aaron. He followed me on Insta and I was like, what the heck? This is like the big big dog that I've sort of been um, watching play my whole childhood. And I was like, for him just to be one of the bros, you know, like even a little thing like following me on the gram, I was like, this is cool. So you slowly, you sort of like realize, um, even though there's all this hype around them, that at the end of the day, they're just normal blokes, bro. Totally. And especially down at the land, it's like, it's just a, a bunch of good lads and, and they're all really humble. So it's, it's, it's cool, bro. Yeah. What do you learn from somebody like Aaron Smith, you know, actually being in his team and the characteristics that he has behind him as a leader? What has he he taught you without getting too deep, bro? Yeah, uh, I guess the one thing that's really noticeable with Nuggy is his his work rate on and off the field. Like his, his preparation um, is next level. Like he 
almost doesn't switch off like he, he he says he does but i don't reckon he does he's genuinely obsessed with the game and he takes his prep to a whole nother level which is why he's one of the the best players in the world if not the best at his position yeah so, yeah mm. yeah it must be interesting to see what those sort of outliers are and you know the greats how they are separated <laughs> across from the ordinary you know rugby player and it must just be the little things that they do. It which, is, bro. It's the one percenters. Yeah, it's the one percenters. The everyone talks about it, but yeah, it, it genuinely is. Like you have some of the most resly guys, but sometimes they can be the guys that, that don't really care or don't want to put in the extra yep. work. Whereas like you have those guys like Nuggy, um, who's the who's the opposite. He's talented, but he, he works harder than anyone. So, What's that quote? Um, hard work beats mm. talent if talent doesn't work hard. Yes, Something so, like that. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Um, if we move to, you know, 2021 and you've recovered from this back surgery um, and, you know, you're actually playing lacing up against against the Crusaders at home, what was that feeling like in the sheds before running out for your debut? Oh, bro, not just in the sheds, but the whole week from when I got named up until we played was like, <laughs> it's hard to explain. It was the craziest week ever because... Like, you know, this is going to happen. This is finally like your, your dream coming true. Like it's, it's coming into fruition. But from the minute I got named all my levels, like my anxiety levels, my excitement and everything, I was that nervous. Like I couldn't sleep. Everything was just through the roof um, for the whole week. Um, when it came to play, I don't know, everything just like, it just happened, bro. It was, it was a crazy experience. It's hard to put into words, bro. It's hard to put into words, but like, it's it's definitely something that I'm so proud of, and I'm I'm so grateful for for the opportunity. Like, it it's was, amazing, bro. And I awesome. think you know, for other people out there to hear you say, you know, even that you were feeling like anxiety mm. um, and those sort of pressures. Um, yeah, but it's so true. Like, you know, you're televised on on national TV. I actually remember during that game. Um, I live in a in a little one bedroom and I had my daughter around Kyla and I had to tea. I, I made her dinner, um, had Sky go on the lappy, um, put on like a few episodes of SpongeBob for her and then went into the other room so I could watch the game. How good, oh, my mate. man. Um, and, and what a game you had, you know, scoring a try, um, a, a, like a good 30 metre dash down the wing as well. What was like, could, could you, did you believe that you could score? Um, and what was that f you, you, like did you think it was a, a dream because they always say you know if you yeah. make a debut you want to debut yeah. strong and hard yeah um, and you did exactly that it, it's, it's sort of funny yeah it was sort of like everything that could have happened happened like everything sort of went right for me in my debut I was really lucky I ended up getting man of the match scored you know my dad and my stepmom were there supporting like it was genuinely like a dream come true the only thing is we didn't get that icing in the cake mm -hmm. we lost mm -hmm. Fair play to the Crusaders, their unreal side, but yeah, bro, it was it was crazy, and I definitely didn't think I would have scored. Like, um, I don't know, you sort of dream of it, and when it actually happened and it was unfolding, I genuinely thought my my legs were gonna fall off, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was running on water, bro. Felt like the like I was in a marathon or something, but yeah gen when i put the ball down and I, I i threw it up in the air and i just like spread my arms and i was like boys boys, come came, here. boys came here came and gave me a hug i think it was nuggy and nani two of my bros so bro it was the best feeling genuinely the best under the roof like round one versus the crusaders and four side buttons pumping i was like unbelievable oh, all dreams. the dunnies breathers there bro, too yeah. in the zoo the zoo's absolutely popping off i'm like man this is this is what i live for you know love it man love mm. it what can you say about the sort of physical conditioning to be, you know, a professional rugby player in New Zealand? What sort of training do you guys go through um, in order to get up to sort of physical spec, ready to perform? Because, man, you're lacing up against some some animals, some some big, big men. Yeah. Uh, the physical conditioning side of thing is, is we don't really get a break, bro. These days, like, rugby is a full year sort of thing. We get a, you get a month off over Christmas and then two weeks over um, in between minor 10 and super rugby. But other than that, we we've got programs. We're training like a full-time job, you know, sort of eight thirty nine AM to, I guess, 4 PM in the afternoon. So not quite, um, a standard office hours, but yeah, bro, we get put through the ringer and I think everyone's sort of, 
they see these reg- super rugby players and they're like, man, these guys are living the dream, but they don't actually see what goes on behind closed doors. It's like when we're not under the f- the big bright lights, that's that's actually where all the hard work goes in. Like, yeah, when we, we're having fun on a Saturday, but man, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're getting smoked. And, and a preseason for super rugby is last year. Last year was the toughest thing. One of the toughest things I've ever done. I was like, Every day we're running, like carrying things. It's it's hard to put into words. And just a professional environment like Super Rugby is, I think just the pressure and um, the competitiveness of even being in that environment itself is really draining. So it's pretty hard. Um, it's a pretty hard environment to be in every single day. But yeah. like, I mean, that's why we get pretty good results out of it, I guess, like. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I can imagine the the preseason training must be pretty tough after mm. you've had you know a few months off. Probably had a few pies, enjoyed yourself over Christmas. A few too many spades. A few too many spades. <laughs> like the sponsor. Um, what what does that teach you about discipline, too, bro? You know, and 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 work ethic. I think is the big thing there from being around those boys. I think it's around balance. Uh, you one thing that the Landis has taught me is the ability to switch on and switch off. I think. Um, yeah, bro, like when it's time to work, we work, but then at the same time when it's time to play, we play, which is literally, it's it's we're told that's all good at the Highlanders, which low-key like differs in other unions, like the Crusaders, for example. They're not, they're not so, mm. you know, they're not so for that. Yeah. But I think, yeah, bro, that's definitely one thing that's helped me, like just accepting that it's all good to have a break, you know, it's all good, just don't let it get out of hand you know have that balance still train i don't know three times a week or something in the off season or go hard you know yeah Yeah, bro work hard play hard exactly play Uh, harder play harder that's the one um for the for the rest of the for the rest of the season you know you like you had a really good season scored another meat pie against the crusaders um and when i watch you play bro um you know you play with so much confidence um and confidence in the ability of yourself you know taking those high balls like actually backing yourself to to to, um to break the line um where where does where does that confidence come from is that some inner belief you've always had or is that taught Uh, it's definitely not taught although it is backed by like my coach tony brown i sort of asked him before i made my debut i was like how much free license do i have to just go out there and play and before like that's what i was gonna say but before i could even finish the sentence he was just like free just go out there do your thing so to have a coach that says that to you and he had he'd seen me play two games in my whole life like he hadn't really seen me play so to have someone back you like that at at the level we were playing at was crazy like i was I'm stoked. I was like, man, this is awesome. I'm just going to go play. But I think the confidence is something I've always sort of had. I guess it comes, I think it comes down to like my competitiveness. Like growing up, I was the Monopoly board flipper. I was like, if we were playing something, bro, I'm sweating. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> is my little brother's the exact same bow. But I was, I was that guy, you know, I'm, if I'm playing, I'm going 100% and I'm going to beat you. <laughs> Yeah. it doesn't matter if it's social it's not social to me I'm, I'm playing so I think a lot of it comes down to that it, it, and sometimes it might look like confidence but it's actually just me giving it my 110% because yeah my mum always said go out or go home and I guess that's something I've always done bro 100% man mm-hmm. oh that's awesome um, so yeah you had a had a successful year uh, what what were some of the other highlights that you had throughout that season man Um, some of the other highlights <laughs> the we beat the crusaders at home there was that's my number one highlight um i think i think just actually sort of proving to myself and everyone else that i am good enough to be at that level was was a really good feeling although it didn't last that long because uh, i'm guessing we're going to talk about it soon i got injured but i mean um yeah bro just being in dunedin being in the highlanders environments you can't beat it bro honestly it's the best yeah. Up the landers. Up the landers, baby. We're winning. We're winning next year's Super Rugby. So if you're a betting man, bet on it. That's cool. Um, <laughs> for and we'll, we'll touch on the on the injuries shortly. But something I did want to touch on and hear from you was, um, you know, how have you perhaps dealt with imposter syndrome? And if you don't know what imposter syndrome is, or the people listening, it's when you 
it's when you get feelings when you feel like you're a fraud you know you feel like you might not be good enough and mm. that can happen to the most successful people i think jacinda ardern has also actually said when she was first prime minister she she felt those same feelings of actually not believing in herself to have the capabilities to do this role and i'm and i'm sure that must be the same in professional sport, especially as you're starting out. Mm. Um, a recent study said about 70% of people do like do have that feeling of imposter syndrome in some stage of their life. Yeah. Have you ever dealt with that, bro? And, and if you have, do you mind just touching on that? Yeah, I think because my first year, I didn't really get my chance to prove myself and down to the Highlanders. My second year, I, um, these feelings of self-doubt, um, definitely crept in, especially as I was dealing with injuries. I was sort of, um, you know, talking. I was having these negative thoughts around: Am I, am I even good enough to be here? Am I still going to be able to play? All, all these sort of things. And I think injuries are can play a big part in in this negative self talk. But I think what's important is having a good support crew around you that's always going to back you and have your back, and just deep down, always having that confidence and belief in yourself because. You know, if you put your mind to something and you back yourself 100%, you, you're going to achieve it. I believe that, and yeah, and you should too. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. Words of wisdom, heard it from the man himself. Yeah. Um, now, let's move over to the injuries that you've had. You know, obviously you've had, had the back injury. You seem to mm. be, you know, picking up quite a few unluckily. Like, look, rugby's a yeah. bloody physical sport, man, and it's mm. kind of luck of the draw whether or not you walk away scot-free scot, scot free, yeah. or you do pick up some niggles along the way. Um, for those who are just listening as well, Connor's got his left, uh, his left arm in a cast, a nice black one too with some mm. rubber bands on it. Best friends bracelets Best from my friend little brother. bracelets. Um, <laughs> what happened there? I, I, I think if I remember, you dislocated your elbow. I did dislocate my elbow. That was actually, um, that was last year. That was, but as I healed from my back, I came back, I played two games and I, boom, next minute I've dislocated my elbow. So I'm out for another uh, 10 weeks. We were supposed to be 12, but I rehabbed the shit out of it. So I, I got back in time. And then <laughs> actually in my first game back after dis dislocating my elbow I dislocated my finger as well and now I've, I've got like this ugly Mate, the claw the claw oh, yeah geez it's actually <laughs> yeah. it's pretty yeah. it's pretty fast in there right? yeah it's it's not pretty but um <laughs> so I got there I went for a, a, a niggly little run of these injuries and I thought boom that's me done I should be good for a while and then obviously had that good run of a few games I think I played six um for the Highlanders and then yeah went up for a high ball against the Chiefs and fell back and broke my wrist did you play for the rest of that game as well did you go off straight yeah, away or? nah yeah I played I didn't actually know what I'd done I just knew that it was sore so because yeah. I sort of landed on it real weirdly so I just I felt it strapped it up real tight and I played for the rest of the game and then straight after the game I went over to my doctors and I was like man my wrist is a bit sore like can you guys have a look at it and they were like nah it's sweet you know they were pressing right where the break was but I was like oh it's not that sore I can feel it but it's not that sore and they sent me home <laughs> and then like two days later I, I sent them a couple texts over these two days and I was like oh it's a bit sore blah 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 they were like okay all good we'll come and um we'll check it out on Monday. So I went out on Monday and then they said, oh, hang on a minute, this doesn't look that great. I was like, no, don't tell me that. <laughs> so I went over um, up the road to have x-rays and found out that I had a clean break in my scaphoid. Sure. And, it, and it was a clean break too. Yeah, yeah, it was a clean break. Like it, it was, in terms of scaphoid breaks, it was probably the best one you'd want if you broke that bone because nice. if you know anything about um a scaphoid break they can be really niggly like they've got poor blood supply which means they don't heal well so I was in a cast for six weeks and when I found out well six weeks initially and when I first found that out I was gutted I was like man I've just had my injury run why is this happening again you know I was like I'm feeling on top of the world and then mm. it all sort of just came crashing down so I let myself just feel that for a few days I think that's an important part of the process and then um and then I embarked, I guess, on this journey of, of trying to get it healed, which was first a six weeks in a cast, and then uh, x-rayed it as soon as I got that off, and it was still broken. And so, that injury, sorry, bro, just that um, that wiped out the rest of your season, right? Yeah, it wiped yeah. out the rest of my season. Oh, 
I was maybe going to clip the back end of Super Rugby Trans Tasman, which was against the, right. yeah, yeah, I was yeah, maybe yeah, going to yeah. get the last few games if it healed really well. And then my rehab went well, which is like, it was a small chance, but I was like, man, I hope this happens yep. sort of thing. Um, yeah. And so I spent the first six weeks in a cast and thought I was going to be good to go, got it off, still broken. And then we were at a crossroads of, oh, okay, do we get surgery? Or do we put it in a cast for another six weeks and then hope it heals by itself? And my doctor sort of made the decision for me. He was like, nah, we don't want to risk it. Let's get the surgery done. So I was like, sweet as. Ten days later, had the surgery, um, which meant I was in a cast for another five weeks and then a, a splint for three, so another eight sort of thing. And at this stage, I knew I wasn't going to play for the rest of the season. I was in that transition period between Super Rugby and Mitre 10. So I moved back to Wellington, hoping that I'm going to play, um, get real close to it. I almost did, <laughs> and lucky I didn't. But then we went into lockdown the weekend I was supposed to play off the bench, and um, which was I, I was sort of really lucky because I was going to play, and I knew it wasn't ready, but I was going to do it anyway mm. because I was just that like keen. Eager, hungry to I get was into that it. hungry, bro. I just wanted to get into it, and my the rest of my body felt mean, but it was just my wrist. So I was like, nah, I can get away with it. I'll be sweet. Um, and lockdown happened. Trained real hard, and then I thought, oh yeah, my wrist is feeling good. And then sort of had one more scan after lockdown, hoping that this would be my final uh, box to tick before I could play again. And then boom, nah, sorry mate, you got to have another surgery. Right. Yeah. And how come you had to go through another surgery? Is that a muck up from the surgeon's end? Or? Nah, it's just bad luck, bro. They put a screw in there hoping the screw would bring the break close enough together to where it would heal naturally. But I was just part of the small percentage that just gets unlucky, bro. Yeah, and that's frustrating, knowing that it's not anyone's fault. It's not anything that I did. It's not the surgeon's fault. It's just my body, I guess, not not being, not cooperating with me, bro. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Drink that milk, bro, that calcium. <laughs> I know, something like that, eh? I did hear from an old video from TJ Perinara, I think, and he, he suffered a uh, an ankle break when he was in his early career. And... That made him, you know, I think he really questioned himself and who he was sort of as a person because as a rugby player, you know, rugby is your identity. Mm. And he said that he saw himself as a rugby player, but he didn't see himself as a person playing rugby. Bro, yeah. Can you can you relate to that at all? I can relate to that a little bit, bro. Uh, I've sort of always had things going on outside of rugby, so I, I wouldn't just see myself as a rugby player, but I know if I didn't have that, I'd... I wouldn't know what I would be, you know, I've always, yeah. So I guess going through injuries, that's sort of the silver lining. It gives you an opportunity to explore these other avenues and mm. get into other things that you might not have. Um, I've tried to get into photography, which is pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How's it going? It's going good, bro. I've taken a few cool pics. You got um, a camera set up for that? Yeah, I've got it. I just bought, I just went down to No Leamings and bought, um, it's a Canon 200D nice. Mark II or something. Nice. Yeah. Man. Yeah, bro. But I definitely see what T is saying there. Um Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh it's it's definitely a part of the game. It comes with its scars for sure. Um how far through are you at the moment with your recovery at the uh, moment, bro? Five weeks post surgery now. So I have another four in a cast and then hopefully a month of rehab. So come January I'll be hissing. Hissing, love Fingers it. crossed, bro. Love it. Fingers love crossed, it. I'll be hissing. Definitely get some uh, bicep curls, eh, on, that, on that left to. arm. I'm going to need to. You were saying earlier how, how small your arm's gotten, but to be honest, it still looks bigger than mine, so. <laughs> <laughs> nah, bro, you got them guns? I know you've been working on your guns. Oh, bro, no, not at all. <laughs> hey, um, so, and what can we expect from Connor Garden Bashup heading into 2022? What's on, what's on the cards, bro? Uh, what's on the cards? Well, I'm hopefully going to go down south to the Highlanders again and try, I guess, reclaim that number 15 jersey, bro. That's my goal. Nice. Um, another goal, I, oh, I, I want to put my hand up for that Maldives team. Man. That'd be pretty cool. Something um, Jackson's done before me, so if I can follow in his footsteps once again, that'd be cool. Yeah, bro. Those are my two goals for next year. Awesome, brother. Mm. When do you head back down south to the, to the Landers? 
Uh, it'll be the first, so around Jan 10th, I'd say. I'll probably cruise down. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, and obviously outside of footy, you know, you're a busy man and also a young dad. So welcome to the club. Uh, Dilf club. Uh, yeah, man. Dilfies. <laughs> um, always sussing some dadmen. Yeah, um, a bit of dadmen on the cards. Mate, we'll give you credit for that saying. Um, <laughs> that's bloody classic. Tell us, Tell us about, you know, the news when you first heard that you're going to become a dad, bro. Like for me, obviously as a young dad as well, fuck man, it was terrifying. So, mm. so scary. And mm. we've had chats about this personally before, yeah. but it, it is a really momentum. Um, it's just, a, it's just a massive time in somebody's life and probably the biggest responsibility you can be given. Yeah, um, for sure. What was that process like for you? Um, when I first found out, I was probably too calm. I was probably like, I, 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 yeah, it's hard to remember. It was quite a long time ago, but I was, I think I was pretty chill and I was like, okay, but I was only chill because I, I thought that there's no way this is going to happen. Like, I just didn't think it was real. Mm. I didn't think anything was going to come of it. I just thought it was sort of going to go away. Yeah. And the longer time went on, the more scared the more like terrified I got, bro. And um, I was up here initially, so I was around my family. All the, and I, I didn't tell anyone, which was something we we, we both did, bro. Um, so I was dealing with this sort of behind closed doors, and um, I took it down south with me. And then, yeah, I I went through that whole year whilst dealing with that back injury, having this sort of. I, at, at the time I saw it as this massive like problem. I was mm. like, man, this is the worst thing ever. And I, I was dealing with it all by myself, like, which is looking back on it, it was the stupidest thing I could have done. Like I, I wish I had talked to someone about it would have made the process a whole lot easier. But anyway, I didn't. And we, <laughs> we live and we learn, bro. I think it's that typical, you know, Kiwi male thing, eh? We just is. bottle up your problems. Cause yeah. dude, I resonate with that so strongly. You know, yeah. I did exactly the same thing when I yeah. got told the news, I didn't tell my family, maybe told a handful of my mates like mm. later in the, in the, um, and d- during the pregnancy. Yeah. Um, yeah, just bottle it up, eh? Bro, it's 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 genuinely a problem, but I think the longer you leave things, the harder it gets as well. So yes. I think, yeah, if we can just encourage like being open and talk, having conversations like this as much as possible for, for for younger generations, I guess the better off they'll be. Um, but yeah, bro, like I didn't tell a soul until the babies were born. So I moved back to Wellington and... um. And I'm coming home to two baby girls and I'm like, what the fuck am I going <laughs> to do, bro? I'm like, what the fuck? At this stage, like, I, I seriously couldn't sleep. I, Whenever I had a minute of downtime, it was on my mind. I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I didn't know what to do. Mm. Um, and the, the only reason, uh, it was not the only reason, but what actually made me pull trigger on telling my stepmom initially was I had a dream. I had a dream that I told someone and I just, I told her and I woke up crying my eyes out. So I just, as soon as I, as soon as I, you know, gathered my, my thoughts and stuff, I texted her and said, I'm coming over tonight, blah, blah, blah. Went over and, um, when I had a minute to, 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 when we had a minute to ourselves, we were in the lounge and I just looked at it and I was like, can we talk? <laughs> you would have been shitting bricks. I was like seriously anxious. Like my heart was beating through the roof and I was like, I just need to let this out because I can't deal with this anymore. It's too, this, this thing is, the situation's too big. Like I can't hide from it. So the hardest thing was actually telling someone, but as soon as that was over, everything got better. And, and as soon as I said, ask Belle, um, oh, we need to talk. I said, we need to talk. And she looked at me and she was like, have you got someone pregnant? And I said, well, kind of. She's like, oh, no, she's had an abortion. I was like, uh, no, she's had the kids. And she's like, oh, she's had the kid, I said. And she's, and she's like, what? I was like, yeah. And then, and then I said, oh, by the way, there's two. And we we're both like, really? Like, we're in pieces at this stage, like... She's like, well, where are they? I was like, they're in the hospital, man. Like, we, what do we do? She's oh. like, we're going. We're going now. We jumped in the car. I'm like, 
<laughs> I can hardly see. I'm seeing through my tears. And we drive to the hospital, and it was during COVID as well, so they weren't going to let us in. Um, but they made an exception because obviously this is like <laughs> they're in Niku because they were um, prem, mm. as twins often are. But yeah, we, we got in, and then all of a sudden I'm handed these two baby girls like here. And I'm just like, it was a weird feeling, bro. I was like, surreal, eh? instantly, yeah, attached. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you when you have like, I have two. You got one, little versions of yourself. Like, uh, it's hard to put into words. Eh? It's a feeling you can't really describe either. But like, you can't even help but love them. Like, for, as soon as I met them, from that moment, I was like, why was I being such an mm. idiot? You know, like. I, this is this is awesome sort of thing yeah, yeah it but, definitely puts puts shit into perspective and you realize mm, yeah. especially and i felt exactly the same when i finally told my mum at least you didn't have the reaction that my mum had she thought i was coming out being gay so um <laughs> <laughs> but you realize how how positive it actually is you know mm. actually like bringing a new life into the world like that's one of the most magical things ever it's fucking some, beautiful and some people can't have kids bro so exactly exactly like, it's a blessing. Yep. It's a blessing, and the dad life um, chose us. We didn't choose it. So That's the one, man. That's the one. <laughs> oh, and you absolutely wouldn't trade it for the world. No, sure, um, how did uh, how, how did your stepmom react to the news? You know, was it she, instantly a positive thing? She she was she was awesome to be honest. Like she didn't get angry. She was really supportive. My whole family, I take my hat off to them because um, I take my hat off to them because. Uh, I guess we're a big family, like, we're really about it. You know, everyone's there for each other in my family. We've got four boys, four girls, and then um, dad and Belle. So we're, there's a big bunch of us, and we're all tight as. So oh, I'm really lucky that um, I'm in this family, I guess, because they all had my back, and they just, um, from, from day one, I guess, loved them just as much as I did, sort of thing. Yeah, bro. Yeah, man, beautiful. What sort of motivation did it, did it give you? I know certainly when I first had had Kyla, my daughter, mm. it really ignited a whole bunch more like fire under my belly. I was like, shit, okay, whatever I'm doing in my life now isn't just for me. Mm. You know, I've actually got another another mouth to feed, but in your case, you got two of them. <laughs> um, yeah. What sort of what sort of motivation did it provide you, bro? It, I think it just gives you a whole lot more purpose. Like, as you said, like, I'm not, this isn't just about me anymore. Like, I, I've got to do well so that I can provide for for these girls, you know? It's, yeah. Like, it just puts things into perspective. Like, thing problems that your friends are going through, I, I don't know, just might not seem as... Yes. Yeah. Yes. As, as relevant or as prominent as... Because you're dealing with, like, life. Yes. You know? Totally. I'd, and I'd, two. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'd always crack up when I'd see, you know, and this is no stick at all to any of my mates. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not trying to dog them, but yeah. it's the reality when you become become a dad, and they'll feel this too. You know, and when you hear people, and I, I definitely felt this in the office, like in work, where there's people who don't have kids, they're like, man, yeah, nah, I just so full on at the moment or it was such a rush getting to work at the moment it's like you just had to worry about yourself mm. you know there wasn't like another little person you had to okay, get your undies on chuck on your socks uh, no brush your teeth like all of those little things mm. um, but I think it does ground you in a really good way and it it makes you hang around the right people as well and you know mm. the people that you might have hang out beforehand who probably weren't doing too good for you in terms of being around the people that you you want to be around, um, I think it just really sh shapes shapes that perspective um, around who you want to spend your time with. Yeah, bro, for sure, agree, hundred. Um, do you ever think, because you look at your father now, and you know that feeling when you're a little kid staring at your dad, mm. and you know there's just so much love, and it's like, well, just. Yeah, just it's just that that warmness is the only mm. way I can describe it. Mm. Does it ever buzz you out that you provide that same feeling to someone else, being your daughters? Yeah, bro. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm sort of in a different position to you. You know, they don't live with me, so I guess all I want is for them to have that one day. So what I'm going through now is trying to lay these foundations and set up. You know. Just, I guess, trust the fact that one day things are going to be awesome and, and they're going to turn around and realise, oh, this is dead. Like, 
even though they, 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 I think they do know, but you know, I think um, as time goes on, our bond will just get stronger and stronger, and they'll realize, ah, oh, this is. I can't wait to have that feeling, bro. Like, yeah, bro. yeah. No, that's 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 definitely pretty magical. Mm. Um, how old are they now? Uh, they're one on the but they turned one just before lockdown, bro. Crazy. So they're getting get in there. They're walking just about. Oh, Harlow, Harlow actually just took her first steps. Yeah, bro. So she's getting big, but Brittany's a little bit behind <laughs> the wee love. Yeah, she's a bit of a small wee bean, but so, she'll she'll get there. So sweet, bro. Mm. Um, and there's I think another layer of like protection when you become a dad, especially to daughters. Um, and they they always say that you know dads can be so protective. Have you? Have you had any thoughts around when they might first get like their first boyfriend? Shit, and- no, 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 none of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro, none of that. <laughs> I've said, um, I've said some of the boys will, uh, will all like buy some leather jackets and stuff. We'll yeah, get bro. into like a garage and he'll walk up and he'll be like, hi, my name's Tom or something. And I'll just give him the most man handshake he's ever had. Yeah. We'll be drinking Cody's and just try and scare him off. Yeah. I'll be there, bro. Yeah, I'll bro. be there. Man, man, you call me as well. It could be like <laughs> yeah, a little bro. good service. It could be, bro. Yeah, it definitely could be. But um, nah, I've got a little sister, Eva. She's, um, she's eight and I've already told her she's not allowed a boyfriend till 18 or 20 or something, something ridiculous, but <laughs> yeah, 25. Yeah. To be honest, if I was a little boy, I wouldn't go anywhere near any of the girls in my family because my family is like, yeah, I don't know. We're big and we're crazy. And yeah, I, I don't know. It's something to be afraid of. <laughs> yeah, bro, definitely. I always think as well, it's such a, such a different age, even from, you know, when our parents grew up to when we grew up and now mm. to when our kids are growing up, mm. especially in regards to social media and how yeah, digitalized bro. everything is what's your what's your thoughts on social media at the moment man as it stands um there's ah oh, there's good and bad sides to everything bro and i think that's just this exact same with social media like it can be used as a really good platform but i think a lot of the stuff we see on there is not real and it sets you know unrealistic expectations for i guess our young kids growing up so I don't know how how we can ever change it because it is reality now. Mm. But I mean, I guess what we can do as parents is try to limit it and I guess regulate mm. how much they're getting exposed to, sort of thing. Totally. Mm. Um, and if you've seen that, you know, documentary, the social social dilemma, that's pretty that's pretty fucking terrifying. Eh? It kind of validates everything you think of, and they ask all of the the massive sort of tech uh, chief executives and the person who invented like, you know, the like button on Facebook Mm. at the end of the doco, they say, um, so do your kids have access to social media? And all of them say no. Wow. I haven't seen the doco, bro. I might have to give it a wee, a wee watch. Mm, It's pretty crazy. Far out. So these big CEOs, they don't let their kids on social media. Yeah. And these are like the minds who actually made the thing, Um, like the software developers and, it was yeah, definitely an eye an eye opener for me. But yeah, social media addiction out. is so so prevalent, eh? Mm. And y- you look at like an app like TikTok, mm. and the algorithm it feeds you is just to keep you on there, keep yeah. you engaged. I, I deleted it, eh? Yeah, good, good man. Like you having withdrawals? You like twitching and shit? <laughs> yeah, I I definitely. Oh, to be honest though, Instagram started Reels, which is basically TikTok but on Insta. Um, so maybe I need to spend less time on that, but bro, yeah, it's so bad how much time you just waste staring at a screen. Bro, I know. It's terrible. I wish they weren't a thing. Yeah, totally. Mm. And just imagine how much more present you'd be. Bro, the people that live through their phones, oh, it grinds my gears, eh? Like, I mean, just open your eyes, look up for a second and take in the world around you. You don't have to tell everyone what you're having for breakfast. If that's what you're into, by all means do it, but like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, 100%, there's, bro. There's, there's levels. Yeah, there's definitely levels to it. Um, and what always fascinates me is when you finally meet somebody for the first time who you might follow, like on social media, yeah, and from a social media lens, they look so, you know, I don't know, extroverted, like so confident and stuff. And then you meet them in person and they can just be almost a shell of that. Right, exactly. Um, and yeah, it just goes to show, man. And you look, you never share your shit days mm. on Instagram or on mm. Facebook unless it's something really major. But it's always a bit of a flex in my eyes. It is, bro. It is. It's just literally the highlights of everyone's lives. And I mean, that's not a bad thing, but yeah, I guess it's just hard to 
put into perspective of what's real and what's not and it definitely gives us these like false sort of I don't know false ideas of what people are and you know what I guess you know yeah I yeah, know yeah. no it totally bro you know and what I'm saying look we can um I'll talk all this shit about Instagram and you know Snapchat and then I won't do anything about it yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> like at the end of the day I'll still go on my phone and have a scroll so <laughs> yeah. no we're all good, guilty for it all yeah guilty we for are it. um how have you managed um you know m- perhaps trolls online especially being in the public eye H- have you have you had any any circumstances where people have been sledding you hate mm. um or even just a creepy person who's popped up um from your social media uh i've definitely had a lot of weird messages oh i'll tell you a story yeah, go i'll ahead. tell you a story i had this i had this one i just thought he was a normal fan um he messaged me on instagram and he was just like hey man i I think i saw you on the flight you're on my plane today um good luck for the game blah, blah, blah. like i'm a massive fan i was like i replied because like why not engage with your fans sort of thing and i just i'm getting stan eminem vibes like <laughs> i'm your biggest fan my name's stan bro like, so. it was weird man I, I, I didn't know this at this stage but i was just like thanks bro <laughs> and, then, and then after the game he's like awesome game man i love seeing you play like can you add me on um can you give me your phone number like i want to i want to facetime you and he started like approaching me on he messaged me on facebook he messaged me on instagram like just bombarding me with all these weird sort of messages like he, he's like calling me handsome oh, and so shit. yeah bro and he said a, a lot more than that if you get my yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. read between the lines yeah, yeah he yeah. was real real weird and bad so i just blocked him on everything and yeah he was yeah he messaged me on facebook he was gutted that i blocked him so i just blocked him on facebook too well you know he's probably gonna listen to this yeah well <laughs> shout out to you brother <laughs> And you do get those other the heads like commenting on your photos, like you, you know, just general hate, bro. But you just I don't know, delete it and mm. try not to let it get to you. Yeah. Do you pay much attention to like the comments and stuff? I guess you know, there's always that pressure if you do have a shit game, all of the critics start to come out. And the thing about social media is every everybody has has opinions, right? It could mm. be you know a fat bloody fifty five year old in their mum's basement, but. Mm their voice is still as loud as the person saying, yeah, good job, Connor, great game. Yeah, I, I, I'm probably bad because I actually do read some of the comments say, like, I'm just just out of curiosity, curiosity, bro, I go on, like, if the Highlanders post something about the game, I'll click on the comments and just have a wee scroll and just see what, see what people say because, I don't know, I find it entertaining. And, man, people in New Zealand are ruthless, like, especially towards rugby players. I don't know what it is that makes them think that it's all good to tear someone down like this, but if you have one bad game, um, you can honestly just like never live it down and people are just going to shred you to the bone. And it's like, why, bro? What do you get out of that? Mm, exactly. It's not all good. No, it's not. Um, I think for all of these fans, you know, you get some diehard people there who just mm. bleed blue, bleed red, whatever yeah. the team is. Um, and for them... It's their life, and look, those are the fans that make that that make up the game, right? They're the ones that that pay the bills, buy the buy the tickets to the game every week. But yeah, dealing with dealing with internet trolls is a, just a whole other beast, eh? Yeah, it is a beast, and I and I think de- like dealing with things, we sort of get we do get schooled a little bit on how to deal with it. So we are pretty good these days, but there's definitely like some. I know one one of my bros, he sort of had to like delete um, his social media accounts because it got to that bait like he deleted his facebook deleted his instagram and i think he might be back on facebook now but it's just sad bro mm, you know mm, yeah some dicks out there there no is some about dicks it. out there <laughs> um do you also get you know taught around the sort of mental aspects of the game i'm guessing you guys have like maybe psychologists there and people who sort of speak around the sort of mental side of rugby yeah yeah we get taught heaps around that it's honestly just as just as big of a part like they say um rugby is one of the top two inches of your body so like yeah we get a lot of um schooling around there we get um so psych- oh i don't even know the word bro too hoary it's part of much of primary <laughs> schooling for you um Love it. but yeah we do get all these like mental um skills coaches coming in and um giving us tools how to deal with pressure how to deal with um self-doubt and all those things so it's a big part of um 
rugby and and professional environment and i think it's just getting better and better which is yeah. cool because it, it it's probably not as um prevalent in young uh young rugby like teams and schools and stuff I don't, I don't think i had anyone really really like gone to the depths of um mental like skills mm. until i reach a certain level mm. yeah do most of the boys in the highlanders like do they do they utilize their service as well like it's there's, there's no stigma it's like sort of mm. associated to it no nah, there's no stigma and we don't get oh, a choice often the time like which is good because if we did a lot of the boys probably wouldn't go yeah yeah so we don't get a choice they'll have like pd they call it pd sessions which is called personal development sessions and um yeah, they'll have these people come in and, and we have no choice, bro. we got to do it, which is actually, at the end of the day, it's good for us, you know. Yeah. They help, they're there to help us be better people. Nice, bro. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, for the, and uh, sort of sort of just wrapping up, what's the next sort of, you know, five, ten, ten years look like for you, man? You, you're happy at the Highlanders? Stay there, smash it up, Māori All Blacks. Mm. Yeah, I do love the Highlanders, <laughs> although... Wellington is home and the girls are here so mm. that's that will pay, play a part um for my future decisions but I mean for the meantime yeah land is hard you know I'm gonna wrap it down there Good. um there's two yeah I'll probably stay in New Zealand for the next two world cups and if I'm not all black by then I'll go overseas which is obviously like what everyone sort of does these days you know you got to make hay while the sun shines so yeah. I'll probably look into that um after that next World Cup, but yeah, for the, for the meantime, I'm happy, bro. Playing for the Islanders, play for the Lions, um, and I like switching between the two cities, bro. Wellington and Dunners, they're pretty mm. similar, but they're different as well. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a nice balance of being here back home and then away as well. Yeah, bro, to- totally. Yeah. Hey, before we end, and we'll end on a little bit of a quote, uh, but we'll just do some some quick sort of questions here. Um, who would be the worst person to run it straight to you? <laughs> uh, Don't say me, because I know I'm pretty big. <laughs> Oscar Pope Moody? <laughs> um, nah, uh, probably a Safwa Omoa or a Lex Fidel or Nani La Mafia. I wouldn't want to be any of those three, man. Nah, Stuff bro. There. Shit. Um, <laughs> who would you like to run it straight to? Jackson. Jackson? <laughs> yeah, bro. I would love to, I'd love to run it straight to Jackson and just, just for the lols, bro, just see who comes off best. That would be hilarious. It and be. I'm sure it's going to happen one day. Yeah. We, we, the only time we've ever played against each other was a sevens tournament in school and I was like a midget, so nothing really happened. But we, a preseason game in, um, and Alexandra this year where Highlanders played the Hurricanes and we were on the wing against each other I came off the bench and he was just about to go off but we looked at each other and we were just cracking up he was like mismatch out here I got this guy he's nothing blah, blah, blah. he was talking schmack and I was just like laughing to him crack up so that'll happen it'll crack happen. up who do you reckon will, will, will get off the uh, the stronger man or get off the better side <laughs> oof it's hard because I'm faster but he's pro- he's stronger so it'll be a good contact <laughs> mate set up the pay-per-view i could just do it in yeah. the backyard to get everyone shipping 20 bucks yeah. i'd see that i'll set my camera up <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. get some photography going on yeah bro um connor what is the meaning of life oh far out that's a yeah going from running a straight to the meaning of life is <laughs> what is the meaning of life i think the meaning of life is to spread peace love and positivity bro yeah Love it. Good vibes. Beautiful. Good vibes only. Mm. What does legacy mean to you? Um, legacy is me, but it's my family. It's what I'm gonna what's gonna still be here when I'm gone. Yeah. It's yeah. it's the way people are gonna think about me when I die. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. If you could change one thing in New Zealand, what would this be? Oh that's there's a lot of things that need to change, I think, but sort of on the on the topic of what we've been talking about around mental health and stuff, I think there needs to be a lot more, like a a lot more done in the younger in the younger people, like in schools and stuff. They need to be taught about mental health and given these workshops and all these sort of things and normalize it at from the young age, bro. Because there's so many young kids that are just ending their life prematurely because they don't know how to deal with these things, and it's fucking sad, man. Like oh, it is so sad. So I think the more we can do in that space, the better. Mm. Um, what is your advice for 
you know, young aspiring rugby players keen to keen to make it in the big leagues. What's your what's your? They say two pieces of two pieces of advice for them. I won't. Hmm, actually, no, I will. I'll say work hard because you've got to work hard. And uh, uh, people always say that, but I, honestly, like you're not going to get anywhere if you don't. Yeah. And I think. I guess personally, the most important thing that I've I've learned over the past few years and when I've been at my best is when I've actually just accepted the fact that it's okay to switch on and switch off mm. and be you. Like you're you're at your best when you're happy and you're you know, you're just you, you're not trying to be anyone else. So Beautiful yeah, man. Love it. Uh before we hit off with the quotes, where can people keep up with you, bro? What's the uh Instagram handles? How can mm. they stay in touch with what you get up to? Corner Garden Bishop on Insta and um, yeah, just keep in touch with the Lions, Wellington Lions and um, the Highlanders. Man. And you'll see me there. Copper Highlanders shirt to everybody listening. Oh yeah. And hopefully Connor can suss a Spates summit our sponsorship for the podcast. That's your little work to do, eh? Shit, yeah. If you Post come this. to a game, I'll buy you a Spates. There boom. you go. Boom. Cool. Hey, I will end on a on a bit of a bit of a quote. This one's from Mark Twain. I'll be lying if I told you who I knew um if I knew who Mark Twain was. I believe he was like an old writer or something. But I thought it was a pretty, pretty special quote and probably quite fitting for this episode. 20, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things that you did do. So throw off the bowlines, sail away from the safe harbour, explore, dream and discover. Mm, beautiful, bro. Cool. What ends on that? 